In uh, 2019, Theresa May, does everyone remember her? You know, she was <laughs> Prime Minister just a few years ago. Um, um, but she uh, commissioned a report in 2019 on how the union worked uh, and how it could be saved, basically. Uh, it was supposed to be written by this guy, uh, Lord uh, Dunlop. And this report was uh, delayed for years and years. It was kind of hidden away in Whitehall. Obviously, Theresa May had commissioned it. Boris Johnson didn't have much interest in publishing it. But um, nonetheless, it was published in March this year, this report on, uh, on saving the union. Um, and it was prepared, obviously, because of a fear among senior Tories um, and establishment figures generally, uh, that the UK was uh, sleepwalking towards disaster, uh, as it always seems to be. Um, that the political hostility that had uh, been built up between the devolved and central governments in the UK um, was uh, becoming untenable. That uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland um, were kind of being left behind, or there was a sense in those countries that they're being left behind by the UK government, which was increasingly becoming just a, a government for England, basically. Um, and the threats to the Union and the, and the kind of consequences of this um, uh, this, this sort of division is, is quite obvious, of course. Support for Scottish independence is at uh, historic highs. It was uh, nearly 60% in polls this time last year, and has only kind of fallen back slightly since. Um, and has seen really uh, continuous uh, growth and, uh, and, well, and stability, basically, in support for Scottish independence since um, the 2014 independence referendum, which, uh, you know, obviously came back with a majority in favour of remaining in the United Kingdom, but nonetheless it registered a historic uh, 45% um, support for independence for Scotland, um, which uh, of course is a product of a, a kind of a longer term rise and stuff like that as well, but uh, as well as a kind of a short term, uh, a real kind of shock to the ruling class uh, that they would uh, jump from the kind of typical uh, levels of you know, kind of around 30% uh, all the way up to, to nearly 50% in some polls in September kind of 2014. Um, and the SNP, the Scottish National Party, of course, they continue to press their, their demands that the Tories allow another independence referendum. Um, their most up-to-date kind of demand is that they want one by about uh, 2023, really. So not next year, but the year after. Um, which realistically means they would have to be, uh, you know, either the end of this year or the start of next year, that they would have to start planning for it, basically. Um, but uh, the Tories, of course, they just uh, say no to this um, proposal. Um, and uh, quite an obvious sign that uh, they have very little confidence that they would be able to win such a referendum. Um, and although it's on a much lower level, uh, only about kind of 20% uh, support, according to some polls, Welsh nationalism has also seen uh, a kind of rise in support quite recently over the past couple of years. In fact, the support for it has uh, doubled over the past five years, from about 10%, like I said, to about 20 um, And it was in 2019 that the, the tiny uh, Yes Cymru kind of independence campaign, uh, it rapidly grew over that year into an organisation of over 10,000 members. It hasn't really done much since. It's been fraught with kind of internal problems, as far as I understand. But nonetheless, it was a big, uh, big shake-up in Welsh politics. And now, in fact, the Welsh government is setting up a kind of constitutional commission to, uh, to look for itself how the union works, how it works for Wales. Um, and it's authorised, in fact, this commission to explore um, the uh, other arrangements for uh, the constitution between Wales and uh, the rest of the UK, including whether independence would be the best option for Wales. Um, and in fact, during the kind of Senate elections back in May, uh, the Tories and Labour, and I guess the Liberal Democrats to some extent, were um, looking over their shoulder at Welsh nationalism, um, at this uh, nascent kind of Welsh independence uh, movement. Um, and uh, Plaid Cymru, they came third, of course, in those elections, uh, and on a promise, basically, of, of holding a referendum, they had the confidence of saying in their manifesto that if we win, we'll have an independence referendum for Wales. Um, and then, of course, in uh, Northern Ireland as well, the kind of careful balance uh, struck between, uh, by the British and Irish uh, ruling classes between unionism and nationalism um, by the Good Friday Agreement. It uh, kind of threatens to uh, you know, tip in the wrong direction. Well, the wrong direction for the UK, of course, anyway. Um, and uh, in that kind of uh, Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland have kind of uh, 
you know, transform themselves, I think, uh, into well, what appears to be just kind of a reformist party that represents kind of progressive social values. Meanwhile, the uh, the unionist DUP, they uh, have their support base it becomes increasingly uh, narrow um, and, uh, and 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 kind of militantly, uh, you know, unionist in all ways and unwilling to compromise. Um, and in the last uh, Northern Irish Assembly election, you know, Sinn Féin, they nearly became the largest political party. They were kind of one seat short, one seat behind the DUP. Um, and, but nationalist uh, MLAs in total outnumbered unionist MLAs, uh, and they still do in the, uh, the Northern Irish Assembly. Um, and of course, this has led to lots of regular discussion about whether there will be a border poll uh, in Ireland, you know, a unity referendum, basically. Um, Republican figures, of course, they come out and say this all the time, and of course they support it now. But uh, also a few former unionist uh, leaders even have come and said, like uh, Peter Robinson, for example, of the DUP, he has come out and said uh, that he expects there to be a, a border poll or some kind of referendum on Irish unity in the next 10 to kind of 20 years. Um, and even the government of the south of Ireland have said they're preparing for it, um, partly in response to the growing popularity of Sinn Féin in the south as well, but uh, also the kind of uh, the situation in the north. Um, and in practice, their preparations though are about uh, pouring cold water over Sinn Féin's ideas, uh, trying to kind of problematize the issue of Irish unity, make it seem like it would be some big intractable, uh, you know, process that uh, would be, you know, take decades and would not be this uh, uh, active kind of renewal, I guess, that Sinn Féin portrays it as. Um, and. Uh, they do this because there, as in Britain, really, um, the ruling class, they fear how constitutional questions um, and national questions um, can change, uh, or, you know, f and the constitutional nationalist kind of change, can raise the specter, really, that we're all familiar with, of course, um, but uh, of, uh, of, of demands for social change as well. It can become a social problem, not just a kind of really, uh, you know, constitutional one, as it's kind of called. Um, but the uh, the ruling class uh, in Britain, you know, they discuss quite openly their worry that their country, their United Kingdom, uh, may not survive the turbulent uh, historic period that we're in, and may not survive these kind of threats that are uh, popping up. And it's through kind of uh, you know the editorials and opinion pieces uh, um, across the spectrum of bourgeois politics and the bourgeois press that uh, we we see them kind of writing about this. You know, in the Financial Times, really, to the Daily Mail, there have been uh, articles throughout the year about whether the United Kingdom will break up, whether it's uh, you know whether the time is running out. Really, and it's even in like international press as well that I've noticed um, they, they report on this crisis. They have long, thoughtful pieces about you know Britain is you know. Uh, a diminishing kind of player on the world stage, and uh, they're all kind of speculating about will it uh, will it fracture entirely, and will Britain kind of cease to exist as it does? Um, so there's you know, articles in you know Bloomberg, the LA Times, the New York Times, El País, uh, the Global Times, lots of times, but um, and they all say the same things. Um, to use a phrase that the Guardian did, with, uh, they said uh, really it's um, stress levels critical for the union, um, and uh, it only seems to be getting worse really. Um, and in the British press, I mean, in uh, well, in Scottish editions, you know, they write about how Scotland mainly is is too poor and uh, too, you know, uh, small to be an independent country. But uh, in the UK editions is where they wring their hands over this question, uh, over what uh, a loss kind of Scotland would be. Um, if not in kind of the economic terms, then uh, mainly, I guess, in terms of the loss of prestige for Britain and for the British ruling class, um, and a real kind of a, an embarrassment, really, for like British capitalists, um, and uh, a really kind of outward and uh, unmissable sign to uh, to the rest of the, the capitalist class around the world, I guess, that uh, things are not well in the UK. Um, and uh, they're fully aware that the consequences really would be more than just like monetary in terms of like sc the Scottish economy breaking away from the UK or whatever. Um, you know, they write, of course, about like a potential domino effect if uh, calls for self-determination in Scotland, you know, grow and if Scotland manages to, to break away. Um, then, uh, you know, in Northern Ireland and Wales, um, obviously it could be a, a similar kind of, uh, you know, a demand. But also kind of in English regions as well, they worry about, you know, demands for more decision-making power to be taken away from, from London and Westminster. Um, 
You know, they write about how it could uh, destabilize the monarchy, um, about how it could de destabilize parliament, um, the military even, um, and basically many of the other institutions um, of the British state that were kind of founded by, uh, by the union uh, between Scotland and England in 1707. Um, and it's looking down the barrel, really, of this potential future um, that uh, establishment voices, a lot of them, are really pleading for some kind of a reform, really, uh, constitutional reform, to try and uh, kind of cut across these tendencies. Um, you know, Gordon Brown, if you, again, you might remember, another former Prime Minister, um, who went from one of the most popular Labour politicians in Scotland to, without a doubt, one of the most hated, um, because of his uh, staunch defence of the Union and his kind of, uh, you know, basically siding with the Tories and so on, to, uh, to oppose independence. Um, has said that the UK must either become uh, a reformed state or a failed state. That's the, the stark kind of terms that they're putting this in. Um, and Lord Dunlop's uh, report that I started talking about, it also contains this uh, advice um, saying that there's no room for complacency on this question. They can't just ignore it. They can't just act like, um, you know, they can just continue to say no and refuse to, to acknowledge the problem. Um, uh, but what meagre kind of things in the Lord Dunlop's report that he recommends, really. Um, the Tories have kind of already tried over the past couple of years. You know, Boris uh, Johnson has named himself, you know, Minister of the Union, <laughs> as if that's going to do anything. Uh, in number 10 and, uh, and Downing Street, they set up kind of various uh, union units, at times headed by, you know, anonymous uh, civil servants or by, you know, Michael Gove that have kind of been set up and, and then, you know, reformed and changed, just been very inconsistent. Um, as well as kind of subcommittees of the cabinet and uh, of government departments even as well. Um, they've sought to basically try and uh, find ways to use the machinery of government really to, uh, to, to you know, to use it against, uh, well, Scottish nationalism in particular really. Um, and you know, we got a taste of what this was like, you know, last week with Rishi Sunak's uh, budget, you know, which he called a budget for the union, and uh, made a big kind of a uh, deal, a big appeal about that, basically, um, that was you know widely reported on in Scotland at least. Um, I know things they've done, you know, they've moved like civil service jobs out of London, you know, they moved like 500 like Department of International Trade jobs or something like that to Glasgow, this kind of thing. Um, and uh, started a kind of online propaganda campaign as well in Scotland, which is, uh, which is quite a bizarre kind of thing. Um, yeah, we see adverts, I do anyway, a lot of them. Maybe there's targeting me in particular. Um, from uh, on Facebook, uh, from the UK government in Scotland, you know, this is like the new brand. It's not just the UK government, it's not just like the Westminster government, it's, you know, it's, it's your government in Scotland. You know, we're the other Scottish government, is what they're trying to say. Um, and they use it to kind of show off projects. It's interesting, it's got like a little kind of, I don't know, like a little kind of unique logo and everything, which is derived somewhat from like the Scottish kind of royal seal and everything. It's very kind of um, strange they put a lot of effort into this, but I don't think it's really working. Um, but they, uh, they put a lot of effort in this kind of this branding and propaganda campaign about the UK government in Scotland and, and you know how the UK works for Scotland and blah blah blah. Uh, to show off kind of projects and funds and whatever else, government kind of things, that uh, are already sponsored by the UK government. Um, uh, which, you know, they say, uh, all this complements devolution, you know, this shows how the union works for Scotland and all governments are working together. But, um, you know, it caused a big, uh, you know, uh, row with the SNP, who they say that this kind of stuff just undermines devolution, in fact, um, and tries to sideline the, the Scottish government and the, the powers of the Scottish Parliament um, to... Um, to you know, uh, invest in these kind of things in Scotland, um, and uh, they're directly really trying to kind of compete, I guess, with with the Scottish government in Scotland. Um, um, but uh, many of these kind of things they've tried already. These little kind of uh, schemes to try and undermine support for Scottish independence. You know. Um, they're of course a far cry from the, the real kind of calls for uh, federalism or whatever else that kind of Gordon Brown, the kind of I don't know, left wing, I guess, of the unionist establishment have to say. Um, and really, there's, uh, I think, no hope for this kind of reform in the UK. You know, I think there are a lot of people in the labour movement and stuff who still kind of illusions in this idea that of, you know, British federalism and stuff like that. Um, but uh, there's no hope for it, I think, at the moment, because uh, least of all, really, the Tories are simply just not interested in any kind of reform. Um, 
you know, the open disdain that the Tories feel towards devolution uh, and well, towards the idea of, uh, of reforming the constitution anyway um, was revealed when Boris Johnson he was uh, he was caught calling devolution a disaster um, in one of his kind of you know I don't know like quite a hot mic moment but these things just kind of become rumored that he, he says this stuff in cabinet and then obviously comes out and denies it. Um, and it's, you know, he's been caught multiple times doing this. But um, he called it disaster and he said, uh, you know, it was the worst thing that Tony Blair ever did, you know, as, as if the Iraq war and stuff never happens, you know. <laughs> um, and this, like I said, was condemned, of course. They said, of course, Boris Johnson would never say this. He's the minister of the union. <laughs> um, uh, number 10, they came out and they denied it. Um, but uh, to be honest, it's a rare case of Tory honesty um, when he calls devolution a disaster. Because devolution was uh, really intended to try and cut across um, kind of rising nationalist movements, in Scotland in particular, um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of... Uh, you know, undermine or, or solve somewhat, I guess, this, this demand for political decisions to be taken uh, away from Westminster, really, and, and you know, given out to kind of the, the regions and, and nations of the UK. Um, but instead, really, they've become a, a focal point for these things. You know, you can see that with, uh, with the, you know, the Scottish Parliament and, you know, the, the absolute dominance of the SNP. That's why they call it a disaster, because it has been a disaster for them and for this uh, attempt to save the Union or preserve it in the long term through, you know, this previous attempt at constitutional reform, really. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's been a focal, focal point for what, uh, you know, was denounced and is continually denounced as uh, grievance politics, you know, demanding decisions can be taken closer to home or whatever. It was uh, this phrase that was used in 2014 and, uh, and I think probably did a lot to boost Scottish independence because people don't like just being told, like, when you want change, though, it's just like a grievance of yours, you know. Um, it's not serious or whatever. But um, the Tories, they never really supported this reform either in the first place. You know, they opposed devolution in the 1997 uh, referendum in Scotland. Um, uh, but now I guess all they can do really is, uh, is point out how it uh, has backfired. And, uh, and as Scottish nationalism has continued to kind of grow, um, very much at the expense, of course, of the Labour Party that originally planned this uh, idea of devolution and, and supported it. Um, and uh, any reform, really, that, you know, that would actually give power to the Scottish Parliament, um, the Tories will oppose, you know, and they've kind of said they will. Um, and they know, really, that uh, opposing that um, and, you know, denying a new independence referendum as well, they know it goes down really well with their, you know, reactionary support base, really. Um, you know, these kind of, uh, as we've, you know, I guess discussed over the years, you know, swivel-eyed loons is what David Cameron called them, you know, the hang em flog em brigade is what Rob Sewell calls them. Uh, these kind of little Englanders, you know, that are that are now the real kind of core of the Tory party membership and its supporters and, you know, fill up conservative associations or wherever throughout the country. You know, they're more interested in seeing Boris, you know, uh, crush the rebellious Scots, as the anthem goes, than any reform that, you know, the, the more thoughtful, more thinking members of the ruling class uh, believe, you know, might actually save the union in the long term, whether it would or not. Um, and it's this attitude, really, um, like that, uh, that is what gives the, the capitalists real kind of nightmares uh, about their party, about the Conservatives. Um, you know, they have very little faith that Boris Johnson uh, and the current crop of Tory politicians uh, will truly represent the long term interests uh, of uh, or, or of, of capitalism in Britain, um, or if they will just kind of sacrifice them uh, for the kind of short-term political victories uh, and the kind of spoils, really, of being in government. You know, we've seen they're all just kind of dipping their fingers into the pot, um, you know, free flat renovations and so on. Um, and it's been in several polls, basically, from 2017 onwards, probably earlier, but they've been, you know, in 2018, 2019. Um, have shown that the majority of Tory party voters, you know, it was, uh, was two thirds in some cases, you know, they had said that they are willing to accept basically uh, Scotland or Northern Ireland no, no longer being a part of the United Kingdom. They were just like indifferent to it um, uh, as the price of, uh, of Brexit, basically. Um, and we can't really talk, I think, about like the breakup of the UK without like, mentioning Brexit. Um, uh, the um, the 2016 votes uh, obviously played a kind of hugely uh, exacerbating kind of uh, factor in uh, the, the Scottish national question in particular, but also just contributed further to this uh, 
crisis in the British state, really, and crisis in the Union. Um, Scotland, you know, as, as people will probably know, you know, voted by a, a comfortable majority, really, to remain in the EU. Um, and pro-EU sentiment is, is, is generally higher uh, in Scotland. You know, there's never really been like a trend of a kind of Euroscepticism or anything um, in any kind of uh, meaningful way. Um, and this, of course, is kind of you know fostered in Scotland by the SNP, who are very pro-EU, by Labour, by the Liberal Democrats, of course. Uh, but even the Scottish Tories are kind of less enamoured with Brexit. Um, you know, they supported a much kind of softer Brexit, uh, especially under you know their previous uh, leader, Ruth Davidson. She was kind of a, a kind of close ally of Theresa May in trying to get uh, trying to build support in the Tory party for her withdrawal agreement, which of course the many of the backbenchers, the most you know, fervent Brexiteers, they rejected as, you know, Brexit in name only or whatever else. Um, and uh, in fact, the kind of the current leader of the Scottish uh, Tories, he, um, you know, he quit uh, from his position in the, the, the government because he uh, didn't support uh, the, you know, Boris Johnson's Brexit policies. Um, but, uh, and in fact, you know, they, uh, they refused to allow Boris Johnson uh, to come up for the 20, 2021 uh, Scottish Parliament election campaign, um, you know they know that uh, when people see Boris Johnson, you know they see Mr. Brexit, you know they see Mr. Herd Immunity, um, and they see you know the the kind of the Godfather really of Tory party corruption, um, and a man who does more damage to the unionist cause um, than uh, you know when he opens his mouth than Nicola Sturgeon does basically, and uh, they openly kind of talk about this, not the Scottish. Tories, of course, they would never defame their leader in such a way. But um, in uh, in the Financial Times and so on, this guy, you know, Philip Stevens is one of their main uh, political reporters, and he's always talking about how Boris Johnson is like one of the worst things the union uh, has to put up with, basically, because of how uh, he repels people, I guess. But um, the Brexit vote, really, it served as a kind of stark uh, restatement of the, the, for many people anyway, of the democratic deficit that there is kind of in the UK. Uh, that Scotland, you know, doesn't get the governments that it votes for and so on, um, and doesn't get the, the kind of policies that it votes for, you know. Um, in fact, you know, the Tories, they haven't won an election in Scotland since uh, the 1960s, and they haven't polled more than a million votes even in Scotland uh, since the 1970 general election. And now they're kind of on just about like half of a million votes at the very most. Um, and it's really just like a political cliche, of course, that the Tories are a kind of toxic brand in Scotland, you know. I feel like if you looked up Tory in a Scottish dictionary, that would be the phrase that you would see, you know. It's, uh, it's something just people just say like, you know, like a, a reaction really. But, um, and of course the results really of the, of, you know, like the 2016 Brexit, uh, you know, referendum or whatever. Um, you know, they now mean that Scotland, you know, was taken out of the European Union, you know, against the will of the majority in Scotland. Uh, but not the majority of the UK, of course. The UK was, you know, England vastly kind of outvotes uh, Scotland. Um, and this kind of polarization, you know, over Brexit, you know, that, uh, you know, really caused uh, trouble for, you know, like the Labour Party and stuff, for example, actually really kind of boosted Scottish nationalism and support for Scottish independence. You know, it painted very clearly this picture of, uh, you know, two countries that are kind of unhappily together, but uh, on very two different kind of paths, I guess, was how it sort of was portrayed. Um, and Scotland kind of rejoining the EU has now become like a central plank, of course, of like the SNP's platform um, and its kind of case for independence. You know, uh, the bourgeois leaders of the party, you know, might tell what, in my opinion, is like a, is a really big lie in saying that Scotland, you know, could easily just kind of rejoin the EU on the same terms that, uh, that Britain left. And really, I think this is as much a lie as anything the, the Leave campaign ever said. But regardless, anyway, Brexit is important in that it's stretched the UK to its constitutional limits in, in, uh, in more ways than one, not just this uh, question over Scotland, you know. Um, not just uh, how Scotland voted, but this ongoing debacle, of course, over the uh, UK-EU border that runs through Ireland, you know, over the protocol and so on is causing them no end of, uh, of grief. Um, and big events, you know, that really uh, undermined a lot of the legitimacy, I think, of like uh, of the, the, the state and so on, like the uh, prorogation of Parliament, everyone remembers. Um, um, and also the kind of repatriation of like EU powers, you know, these things, they both saw legal challenges, you know, led by the Scottish and Welsh devolved governments, basically. Um, and uh, Brexit, of course, 
in general really showed how the political leadership of the capitalist class in Britain has, has, has so degenerated really, you know, as British capitalism itself has kind of declined, uh, that they're now kind of mainly formed up of kind of cliques and factions really, um, that care more for themselves and their kind of immediate sponsors than for the interests of the capitalist class as a whole, for you know, the, the supposed national interest, I guess. Um, but uh, to finish speaking about Brexit, but you know, in this situation, just as when things seemingly couldn't get, I guess, any worse, um, and for, I guess in Boris Johnson's opinion, just as he thought he'd overcome the last obstacle to his rise to power by uh, winning the 2019 general election, just then this pandemic swoops across the world, which has, no, uh, which has had a really serious impact and has really fed into, I think, this, uh, this crisis for the union. Because um, it just further added, really, to the contradictions that already had kind of built up. You know, as Nicola Sturgeon and Boris Johnson, you know, they very publicly differed in their kind of style um, of uh, handling the crisis. Um, though in reality, they made a lot of the same uh, mistakes. Um, you know, the cracks even began to show uh, in England itself, I think, uh, as, you know, Andy Burnham and kind of other, you know, regional leaders in England, um, he openly rebelled against the Tory government's uh, policies, uh, you know, its lockdown policies and said they wanted to have the ability to, to take their own decisions about these kind of things um, over kind of health care and, and whatever else. Um, and the Tory party itself became very, very divided uh, over this, you know, as uh, these Northern English kind of former Red Wall uh, Tory MPs, they complained about, you know, oh, there's a bias in what the government does towards the South East and London. Um, and they were basically told by their colleagues to, in the South East of England and London to like it or lump it, basically. Um, but uh, Brexit and this uh, coronavirus pandemic, you know, they've only really served to accelerate what is the kind of fundamental crisis, uh, really. This uh, crisis of the union, you know, crisis of unionism. Um, you know, the contradictions really of British capitalism, I think, have produced these centrifugal kind of tendencies, as, as, as many people have called them, um, that threaten to break up uh, or at the very least kind of radically alter the shape of, if just Scotland breaks away, um, the British state itself, really. Um, and I think this cannot be anything other than uh, the, the result of Britain's historic decline, really, um, of the crisis of capitalism generally, uh, just as Brexit, I guess, was a kind of consequence of this. Um, and to, to interview them, I guess, you know, like Ireland, of course, was, you know, Britain's first colony, um, and it's kind of lost the majority of that. We'll see it's not a kind of same process really. But, um, and the kind of six uh, counties in Northern Ireland that remain a part of the UK, you know, they do so under a very uneasy piece. Um, and they really have kind of more symbolic meaning to the British ruling class than any kind of real worth. Um, <clears throat> Wales has been fused to England since, uh, well, I guess since time immemorial, I don't know. Um, uh, but it was really like the merger between Scotland and England in 1707, the formation of the Union as we know it, um, that laid the basis for the modern British state um, and really the, the kind of prerequisite for the development of, of British capitalism itself as well, of, of kind of the British Industrial Revolution and uh, the formation of the British Empire and so on, or its expansion at least. Um, and the reasons are kind of too numerous, I think, to go over here. Uh, and they'll be they'll be covered in other talks this weekend. Uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, Rob talked a lot about it on Friday night. But I think it's undeniable that the uh, the United Kingdom is uh, you know slipping now from you know what was a second rate power to uh, to a third rate one in the world after Brexit and everything. And uh, this um, crisis of unionism, I think, is a kind of consequence of that. You know, it's. Um, the decades really of, of deindustrialization and, and austerity that have devastated many of these places across the British Isles, across Britain, uh, where calls for self-determination or for independence really are the loudest. Um, and the, the myths and the lies that the bourgeois tell uh, about the union, that it's based on a family of nations, uh, that it's based on solidarity even, they go as far to say, you know, in 2014 they made this big deal, uh, Labour Party especially, to say, uh, oh, you know, Scotland has got to be part of the UK because the UK is all about redistributing and sharing wealth and so on. But uh, these kind of lies and so on, they have almost nothing in common, or they have nothing in common with, uh, you know, the harsh reality of British capitalism, you know, the, the corruption and uh, opportunism 
extremism of politics, you know, the exploitation and uh, immiseration that uh, the working class sees every day uh, as part in this country. Um, and it's for this reason I think the crisis of the union is not just a kind of a, a constitutional one, but it is a, 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 a social crisis, it's rooted in the social crisis of, of, of capitalism itself. Um, so for millions of people really, um, the idea of, of breaking out of the UK um, and social progress in general are closely bound together. In fact, they think, uh, a lot of people think you can't really have one without the other. Um, and this is a real kind of dangerous situation, of course, for the union and, and for the capitalist class. You know, this it creates a situation where any uh, social unrest and, of course, the, the social decay of the country um, just feeds further and further into a, a kind of tendency uh, towards uh, the UK breaking up. They fear this uh, opening of the floodgates potentially, um, if Scotland becomes independent or if there's a real kind of determined struggle for, for self-determination, for a referendum or however, uh, whatever form that kind of takes. Um, and it's because the, uh, the, the national question, you know, as Lenin said, is ultimately a, a question of bread, uh, is his kind of phrase. You know, it's rooted in the material conditions really of the working class and how they kind of change. And um, the capitalists, I think, are really beginning to understand this. Uh, and it fills them with dread, really, um, about the future of the United Kingdom and about the Union. Um, but on the contrary for us, uh, it fills us, uh, you know, with hope, I think. Not because we have any illusions in, in nationalism, you know. Uh, of course not, you know. For us, any national movements or any even movement for kind of self-determination has significance, really, only in how it transforms the consciousness of the working class. Um, that it becomes um, an outlet for working class anger against uh, capitalism, albeit in a kind of semi-conscious or, or distorted kind of way. Um, but this anger that um, many people feel towards the Union as well, it's worth saying just at the end here, um, will turn on the bourgeois nationalists even, uh, you know, in turn, when they are forced to kind of betray you know, the sincere hopes of the working class who, um, who uh, you know, will put them in power and will put them in the position to, to, to make big decisions about the future of, of, of you know, Scotland or, or Wales or whoever that um, does become independent, um, as they must do, basically in order to, uh, to maintain capitalism in this uh, epoch of, of crisis and, and decay of capitalism. Um, but I think all of this, this crisis in the Union really, and, uh, and the, the potential future, um, all of it really just underlines, I think, our duty to build the forces of Marxism um, that will be needed throughout this kind of process of, of, of kind of deep uh, uh, constitutional and, and social change and crisis. Um, we're needed really to, uh, to expose the falsehoods of the ruling class um, and ultimately really to, to unite the working class on the basis of the struggle for uh, international socialism. I'll uh, leave it there. <laughs>